Hey, welcome back everybody. Okay, so in this video what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, the first Bohr postulate and the fourth one and actually derive what you see summarized here in the summary notes. That is, what are the radii of the stable orbits for the hydrogen atom? And more importantly, what is the total energy of the atom? Which we assume, again, is, is the electron's uh, potential and kinetic energy. Um, and that's what we're really after. Um, the radius is, is nice, but we now know that Bohr's model is, is not really the correct way to view the electron. Um, as a point particle going in a circle uh, with cer certain radius. Now the energies, the, the energies are fine. Um, they don't tell you the whole story about the hydrogen atom. And uh, so the Bohr model is incomplete, but it does do a good job in telling you the energies of the atom in the absence of, of magnetic field interactions, which, which is usually are present. But um, so we're, we're after really the, this energy expression that you see right here. And, uh, and then in a subsequent video, we'll actually do some, calcul uh, do some example problems with that expression. But what I want to do again in this video is uh, start with the first and fourth postulate and then derive this uh, radius equation that you see here in this total energy equation. OK, so I'm going to go to the notepad and do this by hand. So the first Bohr postulate is that we have circular orbits via the Coulomb force. Okay, so what that means, right, I can write down, and in my picture here, I'll just, I'll just use this picture right here, I can imagine that there is this attractive electric force between the negatively charged electron and positively charged uh, nucleus, which we now know is a single proton. So I can write down from the first postulate that this force from Coulomb's law, it's Coulomb's, oh, this is a good review of physics two and physics one. So I would not fast forward through this derivation. Uh, but, uh, here you go. So Coulomb's constant times the absolute value of the charge of the nucleus times the charge of the electron. Now, each of these guys carries the fundamental charge absolute value, right? So the charge of the nucleus is plus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, and the charge of the electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So I'm going to use that E for fundamental charge. So I'm just going to write the absolute value of the product of their charges as E squared. And then Coulomb says, that's over the distance between the point charges squared. So there is the size of the force. Here comes physics one stuff, right? Uh, Bohr says this is providing a centripetal force. So that's going to be m. That's the mass of the electron in these formulas that you see times centripetal acceleration. Now I'm going to write a, an expression. Instead of writing this a, I'm going to put in an expression for centripetal acceleration. You guys remember one? Huh? Involving the tangential speed V from physics one or from dynamics, it is V squared over R. So here is our first equation. I'm just going to call that equation one in this derivation. Okay. Now let's take the fourth postulate. That's where Bohr says the size of this angular momentum and we call this the orbital angular momentum because it's the momentum associated with the orbiting electron. That's going to be an important distinction, uh, not in this video, but a little bit later where we're going to introduce. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I got interrupted there, so I had to pause it. Okay, so we're going to take um, the orbital angular momentum, which for the point particle, the electron is MVR. And Bohr says that this can only have certain values. Oops. Let me get back to my pen. There we go. That are equal to a positive integer, which we call n times h bar. Right? So we're going to take that. And I'll call that equation two. And remember here that n is one, two, da, da, da. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve this equation two for v. So I can write that v 
is NH bar over MR. So then I'll just label that 3. And what I'll do is I'll stick 3 into 1. And that's going to give me KE squared over R squared equals M. I'm going to square my numerator there, that V. So I'm going to get N squared H bar squared. I'm going to square my denominator. So I'm going to get M squared R squared. But remember, I have that R that was already in the denominator. So this is times another R. Okay. Now, what I can do is I can solve this equation for R. And I, I won't bore you with the details. But what that ends up giving you, you can double check this, is R is equal to that integer n squared times a collection of constants. It's going to be h bar squared over the mass of the electron times Coulomb's constant times the fundamental charge squared. So again, collection of constants. All right, so if you evaluate this collection of constants, you will get a length, which you should, because this is the radius, right? And this collection of constants is given a special symbol, little a naught, and the value is about 0.53 angstroms. We're going to use that angstrom. And this officially is known as the Bohr radius. So you should know the Bohr radius. Okay, so we can rewrite this equation then as R equals N squared A naught. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll put a little subscript N on the R, um, just to remind people that there are only certain stable radii, only certain allowed orbits that have these radii. And if we continue our numbering, I'll call that equation four. Okay, so if you look at the summary notes, you'll see that right here. Okay, there is the Bohr radius, and here's that collection of constants that defines the Bohr radius. Okay, now let's talk about the energy. All right, so to do the energy analysis, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, um, there are two energy terms that the electron, i.e. the atom, can have. So the total energy, I'm just going to write as E, that's going to be a combination of motional or kinetic energy of the electron, big K, plus potential energy due to the electric force interaction with the nucleus. I'm going to use U for potential energy. Um, you guys may have used KE for kinetic and PE for potential energy. I'm in the camp that uses big K and big U. Okay, so uh, big K is one half mv squared. We're not treating the electron relativistically. That was the first thing the board did. He didn't treat it relativistically, moving uh, really, 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 really fast, approaching the speed of light. Now, potential energy, this, this again goes back to physics 2, potential energy between two point charges. It's going to be Coulomb's constant, little k, times the charge of the first particle, so let's say that's the, the nucleus, that's going to be a plus E, fundamental charge, times the charge of the second particle, that's the electron, that's minus E, so I'm going to get a minus KE squared all over the distance between the point charges, so that's R. Okay, so those are the two expressions I'm going to use for my, whoops, my total energy. So I can come up here and write my total energy then as one half mv squared minus little ke squared over r. Okay, and I'll call that equation five. Now, if you look back here, let me go up here to equation one. See that, that centripetal force equation? I'm going to solve for the product mv squared. So from equation one, let's see if I, yeah, I can do it. You can see it right down here. 
uh, I mean, you can see everything. From equation one, I have that mv squared is equal to Coulomb's constant k times e squared over r. Right, if I do that algebra. Okay, so if I call that equation six, now what I can do, I'll scroll up, I can put six into five. Okay, that's what I will do. So I'm going to take six and put it into five. And that's going to give me E is one half. Here comes the substitution for MV squared. I'm going to get little k E squared over R. And then I have minus the potential energy or plus the potential energy, which is minus k E squared over R. Oh, well, look at that. That turns out just to be negative one half k e squared over r. Interesting. I'll call that seven. Now, you notice that the total energy is always going to be negative the way we've formulated it. That's okay. It may sound weird, but it's just that the potential energy, which is negative, is always bigger than the kinetic energy. So my total energy is negative. That's fine. The kinetic energy is always positive but the total energy is negative. And now what I can do is for this R, I can stick in the allowed radii formula. That's equation four. So if I take equation four and stick it into this equation seven, I'm almost there. I have that my total energy is going to be uh, minus one half. I've got KE squared, and then for the R, I'm going to stick in N squared over A naught. So I can write this as, I'm going to write it like this, minus 1 over N squared times another collection of constants. And that collection is KE squared over 2 A naught. And if you wanted to, I'm not going to do this. But you could take this expression for A naught, the H bar squared over MKE squared up here, and stick it in there and get a different uh, collection of constants. But that's enough. We can do that. Now, if you evaluate this collection of constants, you will, in fact, get an energy. It is convenient to express that energy uh, using EV, electron volts. And this turns out to be very close to 13.6 electron volts. So we're going to write this energy formula as E equals, it's going to be one of these numerical formulas. We're going to write it as uh, minus 13.6 EV over the integer N squared. Okay. And I'm going to put again a subscript on this N just to emphasize that there are only certain energies that this hydrogen atom can have in these certain stable orbits. And N here is one, two, dot, dot, dot. This is sometimes known as the quantum number, the quantum number, because the orbits and the energies are quantized. There are only certain allowed values. Okay, so we did it. If you go back to the summary note, and, and, and notice, this doesn't take, you know, super complicated math, super complicated physics. These are all ideas from physics one and physics two uh, with these postulates. Okay, so looking back in the summary notes, here are the energies of the so-called quantum states. Instead of orbits, sometimes we'll call these, actually more often we'll call them quantum states, because again, we now know that Bohr's picture of the electron going around in perfect circular orbits is not quite right. But we do have the idea of quantized states, energy states. Okay, now what you see right here, and we'll use this in the next video, this picture, this is known as an energy level diagram. It's just a construction that helps you visualize the allowed energy states and transitions that the electron makes or the atom makes and going from one state to another state. So all you do is on the vertical is energy. That's an energy axis vertically. 
So as you go up, you're going up in energy. Horizontally, there's nothing plotted. You just use a line to represent the state or the level. So you can see right here, for n equal 1, the energy of the atom is going to be minus 13.6 eV. So you just draw a horizontal line, and you can even label it like they do here, minus 13.6 eV, n equal 1. This is known as the ground state of the hydrogen atom. Okay, and if you want to push that circular model, the radius would be 1 Bohr radius, right, n squared a naught. Okay. If you go to n equal 2, now you're going to have minus 13.6 eV over 2 squared. That gives you an energy of minus 3.40 eV. That is known as the first excited state. n equal 3, minus 1.51 eV, second excited state, etc. Now, as you get higher and higher in quantum number n, the energies increase, but the difference in energies from the previous level is getting smaller and smaller. In fact, as you can see, as n gets really big, e sub n is approaching um, zero on the energy scale. In fact, physically, to ionize this hydrogen atom, to completely remove the electron so that it's no longer bound via the electric force, you would have to get it to at least an energy of zero. That is going to determine the ionization energy to try to get it to that level of zero EV. Okay, and we'll talk more about that in the next video where we'll do some numerical examples. But here is the equation for the energy of the atom, the so-called atomic energies, and this energy level diagram is a nice picture that helps us visualize uh, these energy levels and then transitions between them. Again, you'll see that in the next video. Okay, I'm going to end it there. Um, I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.